Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary Open Your Eyes here in Florida from my home studio in Florida. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news, you can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. The concept of self-actualization was originally introduced by psychiatrist Dr. Kurt Goldstein in the early half of the 20th century. Self-actualization is a concept used in psychology regarding the process by which an individual reaches their full potential. Today's guest, best-selling author, Ron Rivers. Ron is the author of Self-Actualization in the Age of Crisis. In his book, Ron expands the definition of self-actualization, teaching how to increase our collective power to help us reach our full potential. Ron is also an inventor, and the founder of Spirit DAO. Ron, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Dr. Gail. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to, to be here and connect. You know, as a, I was a psychology major in college, and, uh, you know, we learned about Abraham Maslow, and Abraham Maslow always had a big effect on me in his hierarchy of needs to reach self-actualization and Basically, they taught us at that point is that nobody actually reaches self-actualization. And uh, so if you could talk a little bit about Maslow and his hierarchy, and in your opinion, does anybody actually reach self-actualization? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks so much. So I, you know, when it comes to self-actualization and, and Maslow specifically, um, in this text, and, and I know you mentioned uh, his hierarchy of needs, so I think that's kind of the first thing we should we should kind of touch upon. Um, in Maslow's actual text, he never described an actual physical hierarchy, um, like the triangle that we see so often. Um, that was actually invented by a business person who had read Maslow at the time um, and used the kind of hierarchy to present the ideas that Maslow was putting forth. Um, in Maslow's works, it would be best illustrated by like uh, overlapping bell curves. Um, which I think kind of supports your point about self-actualization as a as really as a perpetual process. It's not some ladder that you kind of climb, right? You hit a certain milestone and you don't have to worry about the past anymore. Um, you know, as we know in, in life, a lot of things can happen. And if for whatever reason, let's say your uh, circumstances go south and you're knocked down a peg or two to the, the levels of, of kind of sustainability, right? Just, you know, your basic security uh, and your, that, your material security, um, that can really reduce your entire process. So it's it's less of a hierarchy and more of this kind of uh, perpetual like overlapping waves. And, and to your point, uh, Carrie, it's it's not something to be achieved, so to speak. It's something to kind of consistently work towards 
and and kind of frame your behaviors and your beliefs around so that you can kind of elevate yourself to you know a higher state of being and whatever that means for you, right? There's no really set definition of what it means, um, but there are some kind of specific characteristics around you know, what it entails. So at what point, or do you think anybody ever really reaches self-actualization? Yeah, I, I do. I, I do think that, you know, after you know, individuals who have the the access and agency in their lives to to kind of have the freedom to dictate their focus and energy in the direction of their choice, um, you know, without fear of destitution, right? Um, I think that's kind of a key theme of the book is is reframing society in a way that kind of better, better leverages our experimental impulse. Um, and I think those who have the capacity to do that, who have the capacity to work on things they love, um, who have the capacity to make connections with people they love and, and do things that really align with their personal values, do ex experience a, a greater sense of actualization than say someone who's stuck in a perpetual poverty trap, right? They're just working to survive and, and they're kind of stuck in that cycle. That's very difficult to actualize in because you're in a more kind of rudimentary base instinct of just how am I going to eat? How am I going to pay my rent this month? Um, when you have kind of certain freedoms, uh, I think the human condition is elevated and we're more able to kind of better you know, express our, our latent potential. So do you think it's related to age? That's a great question. I don't necessarily know that it's related to age per se, but I think without a doubt, right, the, the most of us find, find ourselves, find our security, find our purpose later in life. I mean, I certainly didn't know what I was doing in my early 20s, right? Like I had no idea what I was going to do or what I was going to be. Um, I was kind of just focused on the momentary thing. So I think it's, it, while it may be more difficult to achieve in young age, you know, I, I might counter my own argument and say, well, maybe the, you know, the all-American athlete who's you know, won the national title after a 16-year youth career has actualized to a certain degree, right? Some of their vision has really come to be, and they're living their highest form of self-enjoyment, and, and they're truly empowered in that moment. Um, and obviously, you know, I imagine they have the systems around them to, to support that. But yeah, I don't necessarily know that it, it and I don't, I certainly don't think Maslow had anything to do uh, or any recommendations regarding age. Uh, but I think when we talk about the average human being, many of us kind of find our path, find our desires, find our true alignment with what we want to do uh, later in life, at least from my personal experience, that, that range true. So you think your book is more of a psychological book, philosophical or political, or are you kind of mixing it all together? Yeah, I would say that the book is all three because I would I would personally argue that they're they're somewhat inseparable. Um, so right, like I think there's a in the U.S. there's a a big aversion. You know, politics is messy here, but I think that's because we have this you know constant beratement of a certain kind of politics. But in in reality, right, what is politics? Politics is the governing of relationships. So politics is in everything, everything we do, whether it's in uh, our professional careers, right? I know that you're. Uh, the president of a large association of optometrists, right? So I'm sure that has to some degree politics involved, right? Uh, I've been, uh, you know, in my past lives, I've been a, you know, a competitive athlete for a long time. I was, um, you know, a founder of a nonprofit. I've been in the, the for-profit space. In every organization I've built or community I've built, there's always been politics. Um, so the, the text is really about, you know, in one line, it's like new frameworks of meaning and value, uh, informed by our most advanced knowledge and theory. And, and so the idea is there we have a, a kind of what I would argue is a surrounding kind of meta crisis where there's a lot of things going wrong in a lot of different directions. And there we lack the collective political will. And I say political will, not in terms of, again, the two parties, but just in the general consensus of the people to, to kind of find a, a direction of solution. Um, and at the same time, we're like proactively worsening our problems. So, you know, for example, like one of the um, examples of crisis I illustrate in the book is the crisis of extinction, which is the combination of you know, the environmental crisis, the melting ice caps, the rising sea levels in combination with mass animal die off, especially insects. Right. But at the same time, I think we just issued like a new ocean drilling permit two months ago. So it's like we're, we're not really taking the necessary steps. So that's what I mean by crisis. Um, so my argument is that to kind of transcend the current trajectory, we need to kind of rethink the most core element uh, of our being, which is how we derive meaning and value from daily life, from our interactions with others, 
Um, and I kind of lay out frameworks to do that, uh, really founded and grounded in our most advanced cosmology and physics. In the book, you, you mentioned athletes and that you were a competitive athlete. So when we look at team sports versus individual sports, and you talk about cooperation and comp competition uh, and, and how they mix together, because if they're, you're in a team sport, you might be competitive within your team, but at the end, you have to cooperate to, to, to play together, as opposed to maybe a golfer or a tennis player, which is an individual sport. So if you could kind of talk about that concept for me. Yeah, so I think that it, when we talk about cooperation and competition, there's kind of multi layers for it. And it's like really deeply seated into our, our you know, self-organization as human beings. Um, so I want to emphasize from the start that you know, there's a lot of alternative philosophies of like how we might organize ourselves that are very anti-competition. And I don't believe that's accurate. I think competition is very innate in the human experience. I think we like to compete. Um, you know, as a, a, a previous athlete, I, I love to compete, but when competition is the root guiding principle of how we organize our entire society, like, for example, we, it's, we have competitive education systems, competitive work, competitive, uh, you know, ways of, of kind of judging who gets access to what, um, that kind of diminishes our experience to kind of a single silo. So I think one of the core arguments is Transcending the crisis really requires a deeper rooting cooperative, uh, you know, aspects of our humanity, cooperative systems, cooperative work, cooperative individuality, um, and cooperative competition is certainly a part of that. You know, I would make the argument that in a, if we can imagine a future where every individual has access and agency you know, within the future where their, you know, their freedom to experiment, their freedom to try new things and invent and create is not coupled with a fear of destitution, right? One of the arguments I make in the book is, you know, in the past, I was a small business owner, right? And I think part of being a small business owner is if it fails, you know, you're out of X years of your life and all your capital, right? Many, many small business owners work uh, for, for years, if not decades, just to get by. Uh, so there's such a high risk of like trying new things. And I think when we talk about like the, the larger human condition, that's really diminishing. Uh, to who we are and what we can be when the price of failure is so high to do the things that we we value so much, which is that experimentalism, that innovation. Um, so I think com competition plays a great role, but in a society where the individual is truly free, competition becomes even greater because there's less risk of failure when you try things. There's less risk of kind of getting out there. So more people are more willing to experiment in their own direction, fork off existing visions of the good and, and kind of create their own. Um, and I think that's really where the the true human potential lies, you know, both in the present and in our our near future. So I noticed in competition and co cooperation, you know, in business, many times people that don't know each other, but they but they are, are successful in one area of business, and another individual who's in business in a different area, and they need to be they need to cooperate together to to make. Uh, I, make the business work work well, and I find it interesting. Here's two people who don't even know each other, and how they get together and they cooperate uh, to make a successful business. Yeah, I think there's a lot of examples to your point about kind of cross collaboration. The question is, you know, that I would I would ask is like, well, what if what if we made that process right to your point, which is, um, you know, there's a need and they kind of do it. What if we could make that a little bit more proactive? where like uh, we can take an example of like pizza shops, right? So imagine a pizza shop, like in in uh, in my home state of New Jersey, I think where I lived when I originally wrote this section of the book, I think within my, you know, my immediate proximity, there was like 15 pizza shops within a five mile radius, right? There's so many. And the idea is like, you have all these pizza shops competing individually. They're all buying their stuff, you know, their cheese, their sauce, et cetera, independently. If we were to think about a more cooperative, competitive organization of society, we might, just, you know, facilitate a program where, okay, why don't we combine your collective person, right? Form a person co-op for your local business. That way you're still competing, right? You're ultimately your competition in a pizza shop is how good is your pizza. So if your pizza stinks, it's going to be tough whether you have, you know, cheese for two cents cheaper a pound or not. But the idea is by leveraging a more kind of cooperative approach to our general operations, 
we emphasize the aspects of competition that better serve both the, the shop and the customers, right? They're getting better pizza. Um, and more importantly, it creates excess surplus of, of value, whether that be capital, um, because you're saving money on your group purchasing, and that can be distributed either to the owners or more, you know, more what I would suggest is kind of more collective approach, sharing it with the, the individuals on the team to kind of create a better, happier, happier atmosphere and a, a better environment. So I, I think that there's a lot of ways to your point where organizations kind of can cooperate. Um, but I think one of the big challenges of society today is that because the root framing of the vast majority of our interactions with another is transactional, right? Like we buy things, we exchange things. There's always like the threat of subjugation to some extent. Like, is this person going to rip me off? Am I going to get screwed by this person? I don't know, right? You talked about your point of you have one business owner who hasn't really met this other guy, but they need to collaborate. There's always a risk there. So I think part of self-actualization in the age of crisis from the systemic component is kind of reducing that friction, reducing, you know, allowing individuals to cooperate at a higher degree um, without risk of subjugation, without risk of, you know, being uh, diminished in that process, because that's always a threat. Um, but it's really emphasized by our, our single organization where competition is like the root of the systems we inhabit. So if one person is going to cooperate with somebody else, what from uh, really, what do they need within them? And maybe this goes back to the point of self-actualization to be, to be able to be successful to have a, a, a relationship with somebody else, whether it's in business or in sports, what, what does that person need to become a better, uh, to have a better understanding to be able to cooperate with somebody else? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So there's a lot of things, right? I think, um, you know, we could extend that question as far back to birth lottery, right? Like, what are the circumstances you're being brought up into? Are you an individual who is born into a place of high love, of resources, right? Of lack of, of security uh, in youth. I think those kind of initial experiences um, really emphasize where our society goes wrong, where the individual's capacity to cooperate, their capacity to trust, their capacity to have you know, empathy and equity in their relationships with another is largely determined by the circumstances that they're kind of born into. And right now there's really no alternative. Like if you're kind of, you know, statistically in the United States, if you're born into poverty today, it is statistically likely that you will remain in poverty your entire life. Um, so it's, you know, that, and that's not for, obviously it's statistically likely it doesn't mean that there aren't outliers, there aren't people who are gonna be these, you know, crazy successes. But what we know in the immediate present is that birth lottery has a, an outsized kind of um, determining factor in the trajectory of an individual's life. So, so that's the first thing. It's like, what circumstances are they born into? I think the second kind of core component of that is like, how do they root their beliefs, right? Like, what are they rooting their beliefs in when you talk about individual actualization? Um, so like, are you, you know, do you embrace a set of core values that are inherently collective and cooperative and, and seeking to like embrace the other as one, as, as a part of you, which I think, you know, our modern physics and cosmology suggests is accurate. Um, or are you, you know, are your relationships, you know, uh, rooted in hierarchy, right? Um, so without like getting into specifics, there are a lot of philosophies of spirituality and being in the universe today that are very rigid hierarchies. You know, they believe in very specific roles for specific individuals and, and that kind of sets a tone about your entire outlook on life. So it's it's difficult, you know, to say if there's any one thing that influences cooperative individuality or the, the ability to cooperatively work. Um, but there there are a lot of components that kind of feed into it that that kind of create a worldview for the individual and how they interact with others. So do you have any kind of solutions or recommendations? Now, you know, birth lottery, you, you're born into poverty, and of course we all know about these success stories. But is there any any kind of strategies for people that have it a little tougher to start off with? Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, it's I, I, I'm a little hesitant to be prescriptive about someone who is, let's say, born into a, a circumstance of really complete lack of means. I think there's obviously like you can prescribe advice. You can say, oh, do this, do that, do this. But in reality, like, you know, their circumstances dictate a lot of what is and is not accessible, right? And I think, I, I think the larger kind of solution to that, and one of the core you know, purposes of the book is you know, we redefine self 
as the relationship between individual and the system surrounding them within a given moment. Okay. And this is aligns with like our understanding of cosmology and, and physics as like the nature of reality being this momentary existence that is forever changing. Um, so the argument that I would make is that if we really want to help people who are less fortunate, and, and this is, you know, by the way, right, the vast majority of people alive on earth today, I mean, we're super, I'm super fortunate to be, you know, have the birth lottery I did, right? Like born into this shell, born into the United States, you know, in a, in a coastal city with good schools, et cetera. Like a lot of things went my way that I had no, no kind of capacity to decide. Um, but I would argue that the true elevation of humanity is the collective raising of the floor that we stand on. So it, it's less about like individually, like, oh, you can do this. Because when I say like, oh, let's say, for example, I say practice meditation, right? That's a, a great part that I would highly recommend for personal individual actualization. It, it, it brings awareness to the moment. It teaches you to like focus on your breath, right? Which is an anchor to the moment. Um, it it rebrings you to the center of like where you are to kind of, you know, bring your focus. I mean, that's all well said and done. But if you're living in a neighborhood where, you know, you're afraid to walk outside because there's violence, you know, is meditation really going to solve your, your issues, right? If you walk, live in a neighborhood where there's no grocery stores, you live in a food desert, so you don't have access to basic foods um, outside of just junk food at convenience stores, meditation is not going to solve that. So I think it, it really, there is a, a burden of responsibility on, on those of us with the capacity to, and with the access and agency to kind of direct the flow of things to kind of work towards a grander project. And I, I, it's a spiritual project in some sense, because I think we have to tie systemic actualization to our individual spirituality, because that's the elevation of our collective. Um, but, you know, I, I think there, it's obviously, again, a full circle, I'm, I'm going to go in a little bit of a circular argument here, but it is a little tough to be super prescriptive about someone who's like born into a circumstance that's terrible to be like, oh, do this and you'll be fine. Because I think it's the culmination of a lot of factors, many of which are completely outside of their control that kind of influences that direction. So that brings us to what kind of inspired you to write the book? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that question. So I, I had spent a long, I had spent some time um, uh, in both the nonprofit space and the social impact sector. I spent a, a lot of time uh, doing local community organizing. And, um, and also I, I presently work at a social impact uh, startup. And so I, I spent a lot of time in this like nonprofit, philanthropic space. Um, and I, I'm kind of this hybrid, you know, my personal uh, history and my personal um, profession is I'm what they consider like a technical generous, uh, just to me generalist, I'm a technologist, but also like I, I operate in this nonprofit space. And ultimately, um, I just became super frustrated. So what I realized is that two kind of core things. First, all of the available vehicles for legal change resisted by design. So when we talk about like local, statewide, federal politics, these systems are designed to create impasse. That is their structural design. That's how they were designed when they were originated. And they're, they only exist as slight evolutions of the immediate present. Um, and the, the, many of the movement organizations are also co-opted. And I don't mean that in a negative way, in, in a personal way, as in the people are, but in order to make progress, they have to work within these systems that reinforce a very specific way of being and acting, which is not you know, conducive to structural change. It's not conducive to resolving root problems. So ultimately I said, you know, all of us have one life, right? Like, what do I want to work on? And I, I wanted to work on what I consider ultimately the root cause, which is our available frameworks of meaning and value. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to spend that. So that's that's how it began. Um, it was a six year journey of like three years of just, you know, I was diving deep into a lot of political philosophy, economic philosophy, um, spiritual philosophy, just reading and absorbing and taking a ton of notes. And then I started writing the book about three years ago. So it's been like a three year, just like writing process daily. Um, some long nights and, uh, you know, but, but that's how it inspired. It was just like my work in, in the nonprofit kind of social impact space and, and realizing that, you know, a lot of the good work that people were doing was just being stifled by the very systems that they were tasked with enacting it through. So that's kind of how I, I said, we need to kind of go beyond it. Macu Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields 
acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. You know, I've interviewed a number of authors and I'm always fascinated with somebody who writes a book. Uh, this is over 450 pages, over 80 references. How do you write a 450 page book? Yeah, uh, well, there's over 250 references. I just wanna put that out there. A lot of journals I read. Uh, how do you do it? Every night. I mean, there's no, I mean, I wish I had like a secret formula like of being great. It was literally seven days a week for three years I wrote about two hours a night. So I have, um, you know, some days I got more in, right? But about two years ago, uh, a little over two years ago, I had the birth of my first child. So that obviously reduced a tremendous amount of free time. So then it became a nightly thing. It became a 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. thing, seven days a week. And that's just what it was. Um, and just making it work. I mean, there's no there's no secret. That's how you write a book. You just write every day. And, uh, you know, what, what I will say, and I'm sure you kind of probably experienced this right with your, your movie when you, you were creating Open Your Eyes is that as you kind of build it, at some point it kind of takes a life of its own. And it's almost like it's teaching you to some extent. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm making these connections where initially I had like my core you know, thesis. I'm like, this is the premise of the book. I've made these connections already. But as I start to really flesh it out, I'm like, oh, wow, it fits together in a way that I really wasn't expecting. So that was um, that was kind of my motivation and how I did it. It's just daily, <laughs> daily, daily, daily. And then when I wasn't writing, right, like if I was working or traveling, I was listening to like podcasts uh, of relevant thinkers and speakers to kind of like really you know find some new sources and, and contrast some ideas. So uh, you talked about that you played sports, competitive sports. What sports did you play? Because I know people are going to be watching this and going to say, why didn't he ask him that? Yeah, yeah fair <laughs> enough. I, uh, so I started my wrestling career at age 12. Um, and then I, I uh, eventually when I got to college, um, I started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And that's actually where I was mostly competitive. Um, I had a Brazilian jiu-jitsu career for, for those of you who aren't aware, it's, it's submission grappling. It's like wrestling with, with submissions. Um, and so I, I, from like the age of 19 to 35, I was a, a combination of a competitor and a coach and an instructor in that sport. Um, I had, you know, I did fairly well. I will say that I am certainly not, um, I, I always really struggled with the highest level of competition from the mental aspect. So uh, for those of you who have done high level sports, you know, there's a huge mental component and it was. Um, ultimately what decided me to, to kind of redirect my, my focus and energy. So I was like 26, I, um, entered the, the Pan Ams. Pan Ams is like the, one of the not largest jujitsu, uh, most prestigious jujitsu competitions. And I had been training. I was literally in the best shape of my life. I was in the best kind of, uh, physical state of my life. I was, I felt really well positioned to take it. And I choked, choked hard first round. And I was like, you know what? I, afterwards, I remember having the conversation with my coach, uh, Matt Sarah, who, was a, like a father to me in that, that kind of relationship. I just said, look, like I'm, this is not for me. I'm not this guy. Like I can't pretend this anymore. Like I, you know, there's no future for me for here. Cause when I get on this stage in front of all these people, I'm just like, I, I gotta get out of here, you know? And, and it, the sad part was I've seen guys um, through who I knew several, several individuals who I knew through my competitive career who got to mixed martial arts and in, you know, I've seen them choke as well. I've seen like people, you know, and it's like, you know what, at a certain point, I think you just have to embrace who you are, embrace your authentic imposter and be like, look, if this is not my path, I'm not going to make it by forcing it. Right. Like I'm not going to become, uh, you know, an Abu Dhabi champion grappler by pretending to, to, to like competition. when in reality, it just, it's not for me. I love wrestling, love wrestling in the gym, love wrestling with my, you know, my friends, but it's um, yeah. So that was ultimately my athletic career. And then after that, I, I ended up, moving back to New Jersey and I founded, uh, my, my web to startup. Uh, and that, that was kind of that, that change of trajectory. You know, it's interesting that you talk about the mental part of sports because I was once watching, I was watching a Yankee game, which I do quite a bit. And Mariano Rivera, who's probably the greatest closer of all time, blew a, blew a save and they stuck a microphone under, under him. And they said, Mariano, you blew the save. What, what's wrong with you? You know, what happened? He goes, I don't know. I, I forgot about it already. Tomorrow's another day. Yeah. You know, it's over. Yeah. I don't even think about it. And I think that there's a lot of people that are 
equally as good and equally as talented, but what s separates them is the mental part. And I think your book talks, you know, a lot about that, and it brings that whole philosophy of uh, uh, being strong mentally and getting to self-actualization uh, as a good point of, of reading the book. Now, give me the elevator speech, or give the audience the elevator speech, what the book is about. Sure. So the, the book is essentially uh, new frameworks of, of meaning and value informed by our most advanced knowledge and theory. So what I root my argument in is, is modern cosmology essentially now tells us, cosmology is the study of the universe, it now tells us that there are um, perpetual universes. So we don't exist like the, the common philosophy, you know, prior, it, both scientific and, and spiritual philosophies also emphasize this, that the idea that there was nothing and there was something, right? We thought the Big Bang and then, you know, that's the expansion of our universe. But there's, there's several kind of key points. So Roger Penrose um, penned several papers about this. We can observe uh, black hole radiation um, that's older than our universe. So that's how they kind of understand that, oh, wow, there's been things before our universe. And so when we think about like the universe, there are trillions of galaxies in the universe. The scale and scope of it is so unimaginable that the idea of multiple universes is essentially infinite to the human beings, right? We're so small and minute in our position in this singular solar system, let alone our galaxy, let alone the trillions. But the idea that there's these successive universes um, creates this observable infinity. Um, so that's kind of like the core thing. I was like, okay, that's a foundational change in our perception of what reality is. There's also, um, and this is you know from um, the physicist Lee Smolin and the philosopher uh, Roberto Unger wrote a great book called The Singular Universe and the Reality of Time. And essentially their argument um, is that you know if, if you have these successive universes, um, there's never been a, a point in human history, or I should say in the universal history, excuse me, where things have not been changing. So even if you think about like the Big Bang, Right when the Big Bang first expands, there's this thing called the Planck epoch, which is essentially where the universe, prior to the state we existed in today, used to be like this superheated mass of everything. Like several of the laws that govern our reality in the present moment, like strong and weak nuclear forces, the our understanding of gravity, these things that are you know we we consider laws unchangeable, they we know that they used to not be that way. So they actually did change. They changed as the universe cooled and expanded. They settle into the forms that we know them now. But that's a, also a key revelation, is that if, if natural laws that we assume to be natural from our limited perspective here on Earth, um, you, you, they call and say, hey, you know, we can't consider these unchangeable. And we shouldn't. We, we should only consider them to be accurate within the terms of our, you know, our observation and what works here. But that doesn't mean it applies to other galaxies or other parts of our universe. So that's a really fundamental shift in the, the community of physics and cosmology and that like, okay, now we, we now understand that the physical reality we inhabit is this ever-present change. And that in itself is kind of one of the foundations. The other argument I make in the book, and I'll, I'll pause after this, is that we, we live in what's called a relational universe. So um, I, I make the statement that the core unit of, of uh, the universe is information, right? It's, it can, and that comes in all the various frequencies and degrees that we observe it in, but that's the core unit. And information and observer are, always exist in kind of this uh, duality, where if you, there's no observer, the information might as well be void because if it's just information, but nothing can perceive it, then is it really information? Um, so this relational universe also represents that as individual human beings, everything we do, we think, we say, we dream is always in relation to our, our circumstances. It's always in context, right? We're always kind of fed these information streams. Um, you know, I give the example in the book of, of having a young baby, right? And I have my daughter and like we walk past a dog. And before we say anything, before we tell her it's a dog, what does she see? She sees this like panting hairy, you know, energies walking around. It's got a tail. She's never seen this before, but we give it a label, right? We wrap that thing in dog. And so, and, and therefore like we establish this kind of root perception. So my argument is like, now that we understand these two kind of facets of reality to be scientifically accurate, that demands new frameworks of meaning and value because our old frameworks, which we inherit from 
these spiritual institutions that were really developed long past um, are, are really inadequate to meet the needs of the moment. They don't represent the humanity um, that exists in the immediate present. They, you know, all of our creations, um, whether they be spiritual technologies, you know, uh, systemic technologies uh, like economics or politics or, you know, tech technologies like a software, all technologies uh, represent and project the values of their creation onto the present. So part of self-actualization in the age of crisis is developing a humanity that is not bound to the past, that represents our ability to, to truly be divine in the moment. And I, I, I claim divinity as the moment, as the you know, alignment of our two observable infinities, right? The universe itself and, and human imagination. And combining those two things within a moment gives rise to divinity. And, and that's kind of the core premise of the book. So I'll pause, because um, I get excited about it, obviously. So. <laughs> well, you talk about single truth and relational uh, universe. So is there a single truth? Yeah, yeah, I would say there absolutely is. And this is probably one of the most controversial things that I'll get pushed back, but um, I think I could argue this endlessly. The single truth is change. Cosmologically, that's accurate. So it, the, the universe, both this universe, the universe is before ours, and the universes that will come way after ours, after our species is way gone, um, will always be changing. So everything exists within that context of change. And that makes existence momentary. Now, even if we were to imagine, let's let's put our sci-fi hats on and imagine, oh, say, Rob, what about a galaxy that's static, right? Maybe you have a galaxy that's frozen in time. Well, even that galaxy would inhabit a universe that is itself exponentially expanding. So therefore, it'd be subject to change. It would be moving in its position in relation to everything else. So change is the single truth. And I think that's really you know, something that is, is obviously at the root of, of self-actualization in the age of crisis. But really the kind of core premise I'm kind of putting forth in this book is when we reconceptualize reality as it is, by the way, this is not like, it's not purely fantasy. It's not purely philosophy. This is, this is the scientific understanding of reality as we presently understand it. Um, we have to kind of embrace that in how we root ourselves, our philosophies of meaning and value and how our, our systems kind of transcend the age of crisis. I also just want to add a quick point where in the book, I, I'm very specific. Many of our past technologies, whether they be um, political, social, economic, or especially spiritual, resist change by design. They're very, they're very much like this is how it has to be, and, and there's there's no alternative but this method. In the text I write very specifically, change is the single truth until it's not. If in a hundred years cosmology and physics comes out and says, wait a minute, you know. A hundred years ago, we were off the mark. Like there's, it definitely there's a, a point where we enter a, you know, a prolonged inevitable stasis, and it never comes back. Then so be it. Then the philosophy must adapt. So it, I think self actualization in the age of crisis as a spiritual philosophy is a self changing system. It's designed to change, and even my interpretation of it is is limited by my limited perspective. Right, I'm a single individual um, who spent a lot of time on this, but my experiences are, are extremely limited compared to the, the majority of humanity. Why do you think the majority of people resist change? Oh, that's a, a great question. Um, I think it's, a, uh, I think, so I, I mean, would argue- and, that, and, to the, and to their own detriment, you know, as a yeah. doctor, you know, we recommend certain changes, you know, whether it's lifestyle, nutrition, and, you know, some people can, but many people can't to their own, to their own detriment. Yeah, I think, um, well said, right? I imagine as a doctor, you have that uh, conversation more often than you like. But, uh, you know, so I think there's there's a number of reasons why people resist change. I think um, first and foremost is, is the relational universe. I think we inhabit systems that reinforce very specific ways of being. And these systems have been really, I mean, um, these systems are slight evolutions of systems developed like 2000 years ago, um, if not longer. So I, I think this is kind of, that's the first part is like, we're all born into this, this reality that's bound to a past that we had no say in choosing. Like none of us chose to be born into like these systems that govern global, you know, everything, economy, politics, et cetera. So that's the first part is like by the nature of being within a system, it changes you. And I think this is kind of like going back a little bit to your point about like why why, um, what inspired this book, 
So one thing I didn't mention is I, you know, at one point in my career, I ran for state Senate in New Jersey. Uh, uh, it was just a local activism. I was really excited about it, you know, but throughout the process, I learned many things. Um, it was a great experience. But one of the things I realized is that, you know, the systems themselves sh change the participants. So this is like why you see a lot of like failure. Like when you see like um, candidates who are um, really against the grain, right? They get elected to Congress on like this, this, you know, offshot victory. They made it in. They're powerless because the system itself demands a certain type of individual. It demands a certain type of behavior and they have to conform to some extent to become that. So you kind of, you, you almost facilitate the process in that way. So my argument, like, let's take a, a very specific system, but like, you know, for example, economic arrangements are the primary like governing, uh, relations, you know, they govern the primary relations of our lives. So the vast majority of our relationships with others are based on transaction. So capitalism is highly transactional. It's highly like, uh, you know, I want to get surplus in my actions, right? And, and oftentimes, you know, for me to get surplus, others might have to get, you know, a loss. I'm not saying that that's a bad system in terms of we need to throw it out, right? What I am saying is it doesn't make sense to have a singular system. What the alternative would be is several modes of economics operating in parallel. So specific verticals would be subject to specific laws of per property and contract where others would not, right? So the idea is a more flexible approach. So I think that's, that's you know, uh, a long answer to your short question about like why are people resist change? But I would also add that I think much of it has to do with spiritual philosophy. And that can be either the, the, you know, the active practitioners or those who are born into philosophies that, you know, they may reject, but ultimately we, we've we lacked, an, up until the book, we've lacked an alternative framework. And I think that's what I've attempted to do is kind of create an alternative framework uh, of being that you know, emphasizes new core values, new, you know, what I would call social inheritances based on you know, our, our knowledge um, and resources. Uh, because I think until we are willing to view systems as a part of our spirituality, we're going to be trapped. Like no amount of goodwill can can resist the daily kind of influence of the systems that we inhabit and change our behavior. So that brings us to why you well, you came up with the new definition of self, and that kind of relates to that. If you could uh, expand on that, sure. Um, so the the definition of self again is is really rooted in that like single truth in the relational universe where we inhabit a reality of perpetual change. And we, as these like fractional observers, and when I mean fractional observer, all of us inhabits an experience, right? Where we can see everything but ourselves and the entire cosmos extends from us within the moment, you know, throughout space, throughout the universe, et cetera. So when we talk about being bound to our systems, we have to recognize the depth of influence they have over our lives, over our thoughts, over our beliefs. And until we're more proactive in kind of experimenting with them and arranging them in a way that is designed to maximize our collective potential, we can never really transcend. And when I say transcend, right, that's a really weighted word. What does that mean? Transcend is like, when I talk about transcendence in terms of the human collective, I mean, when we get to a threshold where the vast majority have the access and agency to kind of imagine in the directions that they want without fear of destitution without fear of not being able to eat, without fear of not having a home, right? When we have people who are secure in their person, we truly unleash the human potential and really imagination upon the universe. And I think this is something that we, we know to be accurate because if we look at like, you know, uh, people making impacts today, whether they be doctors, whether they be founders of some silicon, you know, silicon tech startup, whatever, nonprofit executive directors, these are people who are in many ways individually actualized, right? So the individual component is, is standard. That's why in the book, there's a chapter called the science of self-actualization, right? So I would say traditional self-actualization should be labeled individual actualization because it's about the development of our internal, right? Our internal philosophies in, of, of being. But the systemic component plays an outsized role because we can have, again, the most you know utopian internal ideals. But if our systems encourage specific behaviors and we can't escape them, then we will become them. That's part of the relational universe. Like they will influence us whether or not we're aware of it. So systemic actualization as, a, as opposed to self-actualization, is, is there a difference? 
Yeah, so I, I would say self-actualization is the combination of individual actualization and, so, and systemic actualization. And that's why I say the self is the combination of both. Again, we, we, can't, we can't contextualize individuals outside of their relationships with the systems they inhabit. And I think that's a really important role when we think about like human beings and we think about like what I would call the latent divinity within everyone, right? A child is born a tongue-tied prophet. Like they, you know, every child, if we took them from, if we took a child in like a war-torn country and placed them in a, you know, a, a well-to-do family with, you know, positive value, I say positive values, positive intentions, we should say, you know, and they're going to raise them and they're going to treat them and love them. You know, that child would have two radically different trajectories in their life in terms of their capacity, in terms of who they could be. Um, so that's just like a single example of how the systems influence us. So my argument is that we have to break the term self down into individual and system. And more importantly, the self represents the relationship between the two within a given moment. And why is it so hard for people to see themselves? Mm. See, you know, because when people could kind of see who they are, it makes life a little bit easier for them. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think like that... You, like that, that, that like you saw that when you were doing th that high level competition, you were able to see yourself and say, this isn't for me at this point. Uh, but a lot, a lot of people have trouble seeing who they are and it makes them more difficult to have relationships with people and to, and to function in society. Yeah. I, um, it's a good question. I, I would actually turn to more of like the, scientific kind of definitions of individual actualization for this. So there's a great um, author, his name is Scott Barry Kaufman. He wrote the New Science of Self-Actualization. It was one of the books I referenced um, in, in our text. And he kind of puts this sailboat model together. And so essentially, I, I think it, you know, the bottom of the boat, if you imagine, is, is uh, he puts safety, he puts connection, and he puts self-esteem as like the foundational pillars of that bottom of the boat. And I think that that really hits the root of your, your question. The question of why people lack awareness, like why do people lack the awareness to kind of conceptualize their state of being, where they are? Why can't they redirect themselves, right? So for some of us, it's really easy. We can bring awareness to our breath. We can say, okay, here I am. This is not in alignment with the direction I'm visualizing for myself. I'm gonna change my behaviors. I'm gonna change what I'm doing you know, immediately and shift. But I think if you lack you know, safety, uh, safety being the material safety, right? If you lack food, if you lack uh, a stable place to live, if you lack just rudimentary security, the stuff that, to be candid, right, you and I probably don't give a second thought to, if you lack that, that consumes you, right? That that becomes your focus. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, connection's another thing, right? If you're not, if you lack um, the network of individuals, of people who trust you, who care about you, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I've been extremely fortunate in life where I've had people who, you know, frankly, for for no I, for reasons I can't determine, put a lot of faith in me, right? Who took chances on me that you know I don't necessarily know that I deserved, but I rose to the occasion, right? Because they believed, because they were willing to give me that opportunity, and that in itself, like those safety and connection, that leads to self esteem, which is like the final kind of part of the base of his boat. And I think self esteem, which is essentially the recognition of your individual capacity, your your belief in yourself, your awareness that you are capable, you are divine in your potential, that you have this infinite imagination that can be leveraged. Without those things, it's very difficult to stay afloat. So I, that's why I really love the boat analogy because that those things I think give way to you know his higher his sail component of the boat is exploration, love, and purpose. Those those three things can't really come without those bottom three being established. And ultimately, if we said why, like we really get to the root cause of why, I would say in many ways that's systemic. Um, I would say many people, again, because of their birth lottery are born into systems that provide them no safety, that don't give them access to connections and therefore won't enable them to develop the self-esteem necessary to truly develop the awareness and, and of, of our relational universe, of, of our relationship with others, and more importantly, of our own power to kind of you know, exert that onto the world. So that was the argument I would make for that. In the book, you write about eight, eight dignities. Can you explain what that is and why you wrote about that? Yeah, for sure. So the eight dignities, when we talk about systemic actualization as a spiritual project, a lot of the present 
um, spirit, I should say the, the dominant spiritual philosophies of the day. So um, the, the two most popular religions today are the various forms of Christianity and Islam. They have the most members combined. Um, and these are what we would call salvation religions, right? Salvation religions are the idea that when you die, you go to heaven. So paradise is beyond the present. It's beyond your access. It's accessible you know, post-death if you earn it. So in many ways, this creates a spiritual hierarchy, right? The idea that like you can't access transcendence in the present is a hierarchical vision of being. And, and I argue in the book that spiritual hierarchies pave the way for mortal hierarchies. So in, in like kings, right? Pharaohs. And this is thought, yeah, this extends way back in our history. But I think all of these frames of organizing ourselves have essentially reinforced birth lottery as the accepted and primary determiner of, of the success we have. Now I make the opposite argument. I say systemic actualization is about realizing that we are collectively as a society in an era of unlocked abundance. So we have this abundance, but it's locked up in some, you know, in a very few companies, in a very few organizations and places, and we lack the coordination and trust structures to allow it to really flourish. Systemic actualization and the eight dignities, I, I'm making the claim in our spiritual philosophy that we are owed eight dignities, which are food and water, housing, healthcare, education, um, information, communication, transportation, energy. Those are a social inheritance. So someone being born into this era of abundance should have access to all of those things because for several reasons. First, with access to them, right, they have the floor to stand on. They are no longer bound to like the circumstances of their birth. Um, second is that it gives them the right to escape. So I think this is a big conversation that like is, is part of the, the philosophy and one that might be like a hard pill for some to swallow, but a lot of times, I shouldn't say a lot of times, there are circumstances where the parent has a child right, through however they acquire a child. Um, and, and they believe that the child's intention is to propagate the parent's view, not to be independent, but more importantly, to kind of just go forth there. But there's many children who resist that, many children who say, this is not for me, but we don't provide them a right of escape. So children you know, inherit this, frankly, Iron Age philosophy, maybe even Bronze Age philosophy of being property. And I argue that the child's div you know, divine in their intention. They're divine just like any other person. Of course, they're not capable of, of, you know, uh, of sustaining themselves. Um, but at the same time, like these dignities provide a route to escape. So when they're capable of, of leaving, they have access to these social resources to redirect the focus of their life. Um, so that would be the argument for the eight dignities is that through the elevation of these global public works, um, and I do want to emphasize that, these are not national projects. These are collectively owned by the people um, globally, and they're not bound to a single nation state, right? We, we want to decouple our rights, our, our dignities from the whims of political actors. Uh, because as, you know, and, and it's not about, I want to be clear, it's not about politics. It's not about sides. They're, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's all a corporate oligarchy, right? Like that's the, what we understand about like how our lawmakers like make laws. That's pretty evident. Um, but when we, when we talk about dignities and, and human dignities, it's about reframing ourselves and how we, we reconceptualize being born into this world in this era of abundance where the few have so much, but the majority have so little and kind of saying, you know, is that the ideal form of organization or what does that really represent? I think it represents philosophies that are really outmoded for the present state. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. 
MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEBroadcasting.com and sign up today. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also going to be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball, and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Well, Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.